Ponder Stibbins was extremely perplexed. Hex, the thinking engine deep in the heart of Unseen University, seemed to be going full tilt. The ants were swarming through their tubes, and sparks of brilliant octarine crackled across the walls. And as Stibbins stared in wonderment, the same three words appeared on the readout, tapping away copy after copy, until it had done so exactly 93 times, when all activity suddenly stopped. The message, which neither Ponder Stibbins nor Arch-Chancellor Mustrum Ridcully could decode, read as follows. Plus, plus, plus. Google Murray Bookchin. Plus, plus, plus. Let the eye of attention drift into the star's strung vastness of deep space. There, swimming purposefully on through eternity, great Artuin. Star Turtle carries the four great elephants on whose broad shoulders rests the disc, world and mirror of worlds. Springing from the mind of the late great Terry Pratchett, the disc world is a place where magic is real but seldom used, even by its witches and wizards. A world where trolls, dwarves, werewolves, vampires, and humans can learn to live together in relative harmony and where all manner of tropes from classic sci-fi, fantasy, mythology, folklore, and history get remixed, parodied, and lovingly reimagined. The disc has been the setting of many amazing adventures, both official and fan-written, and the playground for many fascinating characters and ideas. The 41 Discworld novels contain a plethora of nods to the cultures and history of our own world. Many of the books follow the development of the disc's civilizations, as they react to new technologies, ideas, and material conditions. And it is these stories that made me fall head over heels in love with the series. Though for the longest time, I couldn't quite articulate why. Part of it was probably simple contrast. When I first got into Discworld, I had overloaded by weird fiction and epic fantasy, including the work of immortal initial bros J.R.R. Tolkien and H.P. Lovecraft. Don't get me wrong, I've always loved Tolkien and Lovecraft, but the themes of decay and decline in both authors' works can be a bit much, especially given current trends of climate change, resurgent fascism, and unchecked exploitation all over the globe. The Discworld novels, for the most part, offer a much-needed alternative. I had been searching without realizing it for fantasy without an underlying message of Sic transit gloria mundi, a pretentious little Latin phrase meaning thus passes the glory of the world. The idea being that the Golden Age is behind us, and that anything ahead must necessarily be bad. Either evil in the case of Sauron, or just unfeeling and maddening in the case of the baddies from H.P. Lovecraft. Pratchett's Discworld offers us a vision where instead, in the words of Tack, the Dwarvish creator, all things strive. Pratchett seemingly loved a comeback story and many of his novels showcase the ailing civic institutions of Ankh-Morpork, like the City Watch, the Post Office, and the Mint, undergoing a renaissance at the hands of Samuel Vimes and Moist von Lipvig, respectively. These novels are among my favorite in the Discworld canon, whose main characters are ennobled not by their birth, but by their actions. Vimes starts out as an uninspired drunkard, and von Lipvig as a convicted confidence trickster and fraud. They end up bettering their communities, and in so doing, they better themselves. The redemption arcs of both Vimes and von Lipvig are inspiring without being sugar-coated. I found inspiration from both characters, even though I will never be a cop or a bank manager. Their stories are about the benefits of helping others, and valuable testaments to the power and romance of civic institutions, both helpful and somewhat problematic. We have each participated in the evils of our world to whatever extent, but we can choose how to see ourselves. Are we simply irrevocably tainted, or are we on a quest to be better, and to create the world that we want to be better in? That kind of world, Pratchett indicates, is helped along not just by individual growth and change, but also social development. Ankh Morpork is the teeming, stinking metropolis of the Stow Plains, and it's often the epicenter of social acceptance among humans for dwarves, trolls, vampires, werewolves, goblins, and more. Like many real-world cities, Ankh-Morpork is also the place to shed restrictive taboos and customs. 
we see such innovations as clothing among trolls there, goblins living and working alongside humans, and dwarf women adopting more feminine presentations, even using she-her pronouns, both strictly forbidden by dwarf traditionalists. In Thud, the ancient animosity between trolls and dwarfs is shown to be baseless, and the novels afterward reference the slow reconciliation between the two races, occasionally hampered by reactionary elements, but ultimately leaving the world more peaceful. The city of Ankh-Morpork itself becomes the home of more dwarfs than in their ancestral home of Uberval, as is told in Raising Steam, and a refuge from reactionary, authoritarian violence. The dwarfs and trolls don't lose their essential traditions, just the ones that harm their chances of peace and neighborliness, to the benefit of the whole disc. Ensconced in the shade of the library of Unseen University, the head librarian looked over the printout from Hex, scratched at his fuzzy arm, and gave a solemn, Ook. He shinnied up the nearest bookcase, his auburn fur glinting, and knuckled over the tops of the stacks into the deeper recesses of the library, traversing L space with smelly, simian grace. An accident of magic many years ago had, of course, turned the head librarian into an orangutan, a condition which did not worry him, nor impede his duties. Stibbons looked over at Rincewind, who was stamping out a pile of loans for the head of recent runes. Settle in, Ponda, Rincewind sighed. That tone of voice means it'll be a long search. I'll make us a cuppa once I'm done here. How long of a search was it the last time he ooked at you like that? Ponder asked. Rincewind gave a world-weary grin. Two weeks, he replied. On Earth, in the middle of my dive into Discworld, I happened to do what Hex, as well as many people on Lefty Twitter, advised me, and googled Marie Bookchin. I began reading his works on social ecology, and I was instantly hooked. Social ecology proposes an end to hierarchies, not just for the sake of political liberation, but as an integral part of saving our place on our ailing planet. He rejects capitalism and the state in favor of a commune of communes run on direct participatory democracy, built to create well-being and liberty for all people, and to aid the regeneration of the natural systems we depend on. Bookchin's work, and social ecology more broadly, has been experiencing a major renaissance lately, with groups as diverse as the revolutionaries of Rojava and the activists of Demand Utopia putting his theories into practice. These ideas set me on fire, not just for their world-saving potential, but because of the many unexpected parallels I found to Discworld. Firstly, Bookchin's writing about the roles of cities in social development reminded me why I love Hank Morpork. In Chapter 3 of The Next Revolution, Bookchin writes, The municipality is integrally part of the sweeping process, whereby human beings began to dissolve biologically conditioned social relations based on real or fictitious blood ties with their primordial hostility to strangers and slowly replaced them by largely social and rational institutions, rights and duties that increasingly encompassed all residents of an urban space, irrespective of consanguinity and biological facts. The commune, town, or city, Bookchin argues, creates a space for unrelated people, to develop into neighbors and citizens, calling this the necessary condition for human associations based on rational discourse, material interest, and a secular culture, irrespective of and often in conflict with the ancestral roots and blood ties. This could just as easily describe Ankh-Morpork as many cities on the earth, and it's a testament to Pratchett's writing that the social role of the city comes across so strongly in his work. Now, of course, Ankh Morpork is a tyranny, headed by the brutal and ingenious Lord Vetinari, and institutions like the Merchants Guild and the City Watch give us little hope of the kind of revolutions that inspired Bookchin's vision breaking out in the city. However, Pratchett's high regard for the institutions of the city is clear. As we see in Going Postal, the revival of the post office and the improvement of communications more generally is a boon to the whole disc. The organization and cooperation of the city's various guilds is another facet of this incomplete reflection of social ecology, namely organized labor. It is repeated time and time again that the haphazard jungle of Ankh-Morpork became much more peaceful and prosperous with the help of the guilds. 
This reflects another of Bookchin's ideas backed up by the history of the Paris Commune, Revolutionary Catalonia, among many other examples, that the institutions of civic life can be improved, enlarged, and run for the good of the people directly, even in the absence of a state, though still under the thumb of Vetinari. The revival of the city's institutions and the power of the guilds show that in his absence, the city might one day run itself for the benefit of all its people. We can see other reflections of social ecology among the witches of the disc, a loosely federated sisterhood of magic users who spend their days going round the houses, delivering babies, assisting the elderly, aiding livestock and crops, treating wounds and disease, and preventing occult evil of every kind. They do this not for payment in money, but accept gifts of old linens, used boots, food, drink, and other such small recompense that the ordinary people they serve can afford. Their services center around their cottages, each witch assisting all the people around her steading. Witches on the disc tend to be extremely individualistic, to the point that a large group of witches is called a disagreement. But each witch keeps in contact with her sister witches, for assistance as needed, whether to ward off incursions of magical beings, or just to keep their minds off cackling and poisoning apples and other such unhelpful pitfalls a witch might stumble on. It struck me that this decentralized network of healers and helpers was basically a mutual aid organization, creating a form of universal basic healthcare and magical defense, held together with tea, biscuits, broomsticks, and whatever the locals can spare. Using just these basics, and less actual magic than you might expect, Discworld's witches have created what a social ecologist would call an irreducible minimum of healthcare and occult defense for the people they look after. In return, the people who count on their local witch help supply her with an irreducible minimum of food, clothing, and so on. Anyone who's been a street medic, helped with food not bombs, or mutual aid disaster relief, or similar groups will be able to relate to Granny Weatherwax, Nanny Og, Tiffany Aching, and the other witches of the disc. Unlike the civic institutions of Ankh-Morpork, there is no central authority authorizing the witches of the disc, and while local authorities sometimes consult them, they are autonomous, electing their own spokeswitch and carrying on with their work not for gain or under orders, but simply because it is needful, and they are in a position to do it. The disc world is far from a utopia, but as I read more and more of the novels, the themes of social evolution, mutual aid, and deep humanitarian principles remind me strongly of some of Bookchin's most inviting and inspirational ideas. Bookchin once wrote, the assumption that what currently exists must necessarily exist is the acid that corrodes all visionary thinking. We humans sometimes need fantastic other worlds and epic storylines to get that visionary thinking going. In Hogfather, one of Terry Pratchett's most enduring and popular characters, Death, muses with his granddaughter Susan about humanity's relationship with the imagination. All right, said Susan, I'm not stupid. You're saying humans need fantasies to make life bearable. Really? As if it was some kind of pink pill? No. Humans need fantasy to be human, to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Terry Pratchett's deep humanitarianism and his grasp of the utility and romance of things like Mutual aid, the potential of the city, and the power of the imagination have given me so much life recently, partly because I see the seeds of social ecology all over the Discworld books. In our world today, we need all the visionary thinking we can muster to get us through the climate crisis and other interconnected struggles. And as wonderful as many of Pratchett's characters are, we need to bear in mind constantly there will never be a bank manager as honest as Moist von Lipvig. There will never be a cop as non-evil as Sam Vimes. And there will never, ever be a tyrant as beneficent as Lord Veninari. It's not gonna happen. The good news, according to Bookchin and many others like him, is that we don't need bank managers, cops, and tyrants to get along in society. We can do it ourselves for ourselves. And that's a future that I think is every bit as beautiful and amazing as the Discworld. So, whether you have yet to dive into Murray Bookchin's work or the Discworld books, 
they're both well worth a look and compellingly complimentary reading. Thanks again for watching. The head librarian knuckled over to the sleeping forms of Ponder Stibbons and Rincewind. He poked them gently awake and handed over the books he had retrieved from only the gods knew where. The Next Revolution and Post-Scarcity Anarchism by Murray Bookchin. Oh, thank you, Stibbins groggily muttered. Rincewind leaned over with a smile. Now we just need to find out what a Google is.